Hey guys, welcome back to A Gut Feeling. Thank you so much for being here. It feels like it's a little bit early to be recording this podcast about the holidays, but I realize once it airs and people start listening to it, it's basically Thanksgiving. So we're getting a jump start on healthy for the holidays today, five tips for a healthier holiday. And you know what? I I just feel like so basic saying this, like five tips for a healthier holiday, because it's like, oh, here we go again. The holidays are coming. We're going to get into the flow of all of these parties again now that things are more opened up and it brings on guilt and shame and diet culture to not enjoy yourself through it. And then, of course, comes January. And here we are back again thinking that we need to be on a diet or back into, you know, our resolution or whatever it is, and thus keeps the vicious diet culture cycle going. And you know what? I'm frustrated with it. So these tips for a healthier holiday are not so um, based around dieting or what you might need to do to keep this going in the right direction. These are specifically based around balancing your blood sugar, which is typically the number one reason why people gain weight or have a major problem um, losing the weight or feel off or feel high or low or, you know, anxious or, you know, can't get anything done, get headaches, that kind of stuff because of this blood sugar balance. So I really want to talk about blood sugar balance first, and then I want to go into dissecting each of these tips as it relates to blood sugar balance, because this is what's most important here for you guys to really get your whole holiday successful working through so you don't get to January and say, like, what the heck just happened to me? Why am I here again? Right? So... This is crazy because I was just thinking the other day that I am already planning for New Year's. I'm already getting my content ready for January and thinking about like how will I reach out to people and how will people know that I'm here to help them through this. And it's like this is because of this cycle that we're on. Of course, we get to January and we need help. It's usually my biggest month. But this year, I really want it to be different. I want to start helping people before this happens. And how I really do that for my clients is... I don't want to have a plan to get through the holidays or like a diet to go in, a crash diet to go in or a crash diet to come out of them. I really want to focus on, you know, basically three things when it comes to supporting your body. Number one, understanding your body, what it needs, what triggers it and what causes symptoms. When you get to a place where you understand this about your body, it's very easy to go into the holidays because you know what you can have fun with and you know what you can avoid to kind of just keep yourself in alignment. Number two is getting to a place where you respect yourself enough to make choices which also comes from having a healthy relationship with body and food. So first comes the healthy relationship with body and food. Then comes how do we set these these boundaries? How do we feel like we go through this stuff? And when you have this in place, when you really have this in place, this is when you get off of diet culture and you're out of that vicious cycle and you're just in love with yourself, no matter if you eat the cookies or you don't, or whatever you do along the way, you feel good and you have a healthy relationship with you. And the last thing that I usually do with clients, especially when it relates to getting off diet culture, is to understand and know your values inside and out, what keeps you in alignment, what empowers your journey, and what makes you feel good, what makes you feel joy and whole. Understanding this is such an important part inside this process. So what do those three things have to do with blood sugar balance? Well, it's all about education and empowering yourself to know your body best. Majority of women that I work with have no idea how to stabilize their blood sugar level. Now, raise your hand. I can't see you, but I'm hoping you're you're not raising your hand. If you are raising your hand, tell me if this is you. You wake up. 
you got to run and do a bunch of stuff either for work or for the kids. You kind of have breakfast on the way out the door or smoothie in the car or something fast. You're running errands or you're working. You almost forget about lunch. You skip it or you get to it too late. By that time, you're famished. Chug down your food. It fills you up for the time being, but then you feel overfull and then you might feel bloated. And then going into the evening, you're feeling like super starving and very snacky and you just can't get a handle on your food throughout the day. This is a very classic day that many of my clients are living because of working really hard or being a mother. The most important thing in that whole scenario is they're doing everything for everyone else first and not really feeling themselves. This leaves them tired, empty, not feeling well, not sleeping well, which does not fill your cup to be able to take care of other people. What also happens on more of like a scientific educational level is this. You're rushing, so you're in fight or flight. Then you have your first meal, which probably doesn't digest properly because our digestion shuts down when we're in fight or flight. Then the blood sugar level spikes because we finally do do get food or you know have that. We go throughout the morning. We wait too long to eat. Our blood sugar level dips really far. So we get things like um, a headache or dizziness or that feeling of hunger that's so, so, so high. And then we finally eat, and but then we're eating so fast because we're starving. So the blood sugar level then spikes. And then when we come down from that, it's a huge crash, maybe mid-afternoon, blood sugar level drops again and then spikes again and down and up and down. So you get the gist of it. It's like really high peaks and valleys versus what your balanced blood sugar level should look like is more of like a stable, small rolling hill. If you're watching the YouTube video, um, I'm making sort of like a rolling with the homies motion. If you get that reference, then you're definitely an 80s child. Um, so what we want is that slow rolling hill of blood sugar, not the high peaks and valleys. What happens when we do that to ourselves often, this huge high peaks and valleys of blood sugar, is that we're creating insulin resistance and the body can only stand that for so long. Now, if you weren't aware what the uh, finality of insulin resistance is, is diabetes. Even if you're not overweight, you can get diabetes just because of causing insulin resistance in your body. So st stabilizing your blood sugar, what are my easiest tips? The first thing is to make sure that you're eating your meals in a, a less stressed situation, sort of spaced out breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or breakfast, snack, lunch, dinner, or breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, whatever works for you to make sure that you feel stable throughout the day. And then things like sugar or white carbs, anything uh, very high glycemic, we want to keep out because those are the ones that create the high peaks and low valleys because of spiking and lowering. So complex carbohydrates, healthy fats, lean proteins, these are the things that we want to add into our diet to really stabilize our blood sugar level, especially for women. We like to get a good combination, not overeating or undereating, of course, just being in tune with your body. So this is really a huge part of what I do in my programs. I'm addressing blood sugar balance. I'm addressing values. I'm addressing healthy relationship with self and triggers and symptoms and knowing food sensitivities. This is all sort of like the layers we peel back inside a mentorship program or the good gut program, along with food sensitivity testing or stool sample testing. So we can really get deep into understand the body a gut healing journey is not very cut and dry. A hormone healing journey is not very cut and dry. So with these layers comes progression. And that's what I do with my clients. I'm their health advocate, helping walk them through a program and these different layers, these different steps of the, of the journey so that they can feel really good at the end of it and have empowerment and control over what's going on in their body, but also the education and a really good foundational toolbox. So when they get to the end, they're not like, okay, now what the diet is over. That's not how we do it in JRW programs. It's not about creating a diet. It's really about understanding your body so you can flourish and thrive and move on. Um, 
big, big, big chance, big opportunity here to get involved in a program before the holidays, before January hits. So when January comes, you don't need a resolution. You don't need a diet. You already feel in empowered and in control of your emotions around food and your emotions around your body and you, you're feeling whole. Um, these programs that I have are very, very um, – personalized. They're, they really fall off of bio-individuality of the woman. Um, so if that feels like something you're ready for, if you're like, you know what, I've been searching and uh, trying to get into a program that really supports me, provides accountability, and, and works with me through these layers, this is where you're going to want to book a discovery call. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, the discovery call link is below. Of course, it's in the show notes. If you're listening, then you can head to the link in my bio on Instagram or my website, JacquelineWellness.com. You can book a discovery call from there. This is an excellent way for us to connect. If you've been thinking about it, even if you're not ready, just get on this call. It's free. We can connect. We can talk about what you've been through, what you're experiencing, so that when you get to, when we get on this call and you feel, and we get through this call, you can feel like you know what you need to do moving forward. Even if it's not to move forward with me, even if it's just understanding what a what a the next step of your journey looks like. And of course, I have a lot of resources. So definitely book that call. Let's get you in before the holidays. I'm gonna shut um, I'm going to shut the doors on booking new people in December. I'd really love to get people on board in October or November so that I can work with them throughout the holidays and not take anybody new so I can really focus on those people. So I have three spots open for the mentorship program and two spots for the good gut program. Um, book that discovery call soon so we can get you in because that spot will be yours if you are ready. So let's move on and talk about the five tips for a healthier holiday. Should we? I made you wait long enough for these. I know that's what you're here for, but I really needed to explain blood sugar balance for you to understand why these tips are so important. Okay. So we understand blood sugar balance. Now we need to stabilize. We need to focus on healthy macronutrients and we need to focus on how to get through the holidays with this good blood sugar balance. All right. At the end of the day, most women make bad choices when they feel, when they fall out of alignment with their stabilization of blood sugar. That's where it happens, okay? So to be able to make good choices in your life, we have to prepare, we have to be ready, and we have to stabilize that blood sugar, okay? So number one, this is one of my favorite life mottos, okay? Apply the 80-20 rule. Now, like, don't get me wrong. I can smash a bag of chips in my car. I love having pizza with the girls, gluten-free, dairy-free, of course. And I love, you know, finding vegan ice cream. I am not, you know, the most perfect eater. Absolutely not. But I apply an 80-20 rule to my life because I have struggled with health issues in the past and I don't want to feel that way anymore. The most important thing is for me to never feel that way again, actually. So I know that I can live inside the 80-20 rule, which is like 80% of my life is eating at home, eating healthy, feeling good. And 20% of it is exploring new restaurants and trying new vegan ice cream or, you know, going to someplace new or out of town with my boyfriend just to have fun and, and really like just enjoy food and life. It's just a huge part of life. If I do that too often, I don't feel good in my body. So it's not that I'm restricting myself from doing these things. It's that I'm empowering myself to live a life that makes me thrive, that makes me feel good. That's the huge difference between diet culture, which is I can't have that because I'm on a diet or no, I shouldn't do that because I don't want to get fat or whatever it is that keeps us in diet culture. It's more about moving into that healing journey where it's like, you know what, this actually isn't serving me. I'm not restricting myself from it, but I know that it won't make me feel good. So I'd prefer not to have it so that I feel good. It's a different type of verbiage. It's a different type of vision at what we need, right? So here's the deal. Most gut issues actually come from two things, stress and food. So 
if you're anxious about food, you're doing two at one. You're really causing gut distress by being anxious about food. So right now, wherever you are, unless you're driving, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And I want you to say this affirmation before you go into a party or before you go, um, you know, into an event or you do something fun. Food does not control me. I respect my body and have a healthy relationship with food. This way you can release the anxiety from food that is causing the gut distress anyways, and you can allow yourself to enjoy whatever it is that you want to enjoy at that moment. I remember um, when I used to be married, my ex-husband's aunt used to make this like green pistachio pudding full of sugar, full of dairy, all sorts of stuff in it, okay? But it was to die for. I loved it so much and I miss it to this day. I would allow myself just... I loved it so much. It brought me so much joy. So I released any hold that it had over me, that it was going to make me fat or that it was going to be the thing to derail me. And I enjoyed every darn lick of that spoon from it so that I could really feel joy around it. And then I was able to release it, move past the thoughts and move forward to whatever it is the next day. Back to the 80-20 rule. Make sense? So apply the 80-20 rule when it comes to the holidays. Release yourself of the anxiety because it's only causing more stress. And again, if this is hard for you and the story is deep, these are the things that we do in my programs. We really release old stories around unhealthy relationships with food. So book that discovery call so you can get in and we can work through this stuff. Number two, this is a really important one. And I have so many clients and people tell me that this is one of their favorite holiday tips. Okay. Be strategic about your alcohol intake because in a normal day, you might go to a restaurant, order an app, get a drink. You're kind of working through the dinner. But at a holiday, Sometimes the food isn't served for an hour or two. You have no control over when the food is served because you might be a guest. And many people walk in and they have a drink and then they might have two and then they might have three, no food in the belly, no food in sight, you know, and you're just now you're getting very buzzed. Well, back to that stabilization of blood sugar, this is spiking the blood sugar really high. And then, of course, when it comes down, it's going to prompt you to make bad choices. So you're immediately going to eat a whole bowl of chips or want to have the biggest plate of mashed potatoes instead of looking at like, you know, the turkey or the grilled chicken breast or whatever it is that's being served or the pasta, like something with more substance because the crappier food feels better when you're buzzed. Obviously, we all know that. So when it goes straight to your head, like that. We don't want to do that because that's what causes a lot of inflammation in your body. So to stabilize your blood sugar in this situation and to more be strategic about alcohol intake, try this. Number one, either have a snack before you go, maybe like a thick smoothie with a lot of healthy fats or a rice cake with almond butter on it. So you're walking in with something a little bit in your belly, or if you know they're going to have appetizers, maybe you're bringing them, then have an appetizer before you have a drink. This will help you space out that blood sugar balance a little bit more. You'll have something of substance and you won't go like from zero to hundred real quick. We don't need that at a party because that brings on other things later too embarrassing situations. Been there, done that. Don't need to do it anymore. Thank you. And then don't forget to drink water. Now, if you're unsure if they're going to have, you know, access to water, maybe they'll have bottled water or whatever. I like to bring like a Nalgene or, you know, a clean canteen or something just with me. And then it reminds me to drink that throughout the night. Like I try to finish it throughout the night. Then I have a little buddy, water buddy friend with me. Helpful, right? Because we don't want to get caught in this situation and make bad choices, especially because we don't want to feel bad the next day. Because, of course, when you feel bad the next day, guess what you want to do? Yeah, order Jets pizza, of course. (laughs) So let's go into number three, since we're talking about eating bad, which is it's inevitable 
that we will be consuming sugar around the holidays. It's just inevitable. Even I do it. I know even the healthiest of people. Like it just happens, right? But the the deal is how do I help you? How can I give you tools and tips to process the sugar better? But meaning, what do I mean by that? I mean, when you want to process the sugar better, we need to figure out how to help your body move it through your body quicker because it spikes the blood sugar level. And then, of course, it does some damage to the organs and causes inflammation. We want to flush that out. So enjoy your sugar. Enjoy what you're having. Enjoy your pistachio pudding or whatever you're having. And then the next day, here are a couple tips you can do the next day to move that sugar through you, to cut the craving so it doesn't keep the cycle going. And then feel like you're, I guess, quote unquote, back on track. I do hate saying that. Or let's say more in alignment with your 80-20 rule. How's that sound? So the number one thing you want to do is definitely eat fiber. Typically, I'll either have a smoothie with some flax seeds or oatmeal has really good fiber or some fruit for breakfast to kind of flush and get that going. And then the second thing is to move your body, okay? Sweat, help the body move it through, maybe jump on a trampoline or go for a run or, you know, hit the gym or the sauna or something to get your body to start eliminating the sugar from the body. Now, obviously, you can swap for healthier sugar options. One of the things that I like to do is if I'm going to a party and they want me to bring something, I request, can I bring the dessert? That way I use honey or maple syrup. I bring something super delicious and also nutritious. And then I can control the dessert a little bit more so I'm not intaking a bunch of sugar, but I'm also bringing something fun that everyone loves. So I like to look on elenaspantry.com, E-L-A-N-A pantry. She's amazing. She has a ton of autoimmune friendly, IBS friendly, healthy treats, gluten-free, dairy-free, all of the things, but they're so yummy and delicious. I I literally make her chocolate cupcakes for everyone's birthday and no one says a thing about that they're not sweet enough, that they're not good. And then I like to make like a peanut butter frosting with them. So delicious. So there's lots of alternatives and, you know, things that you can do to sort of make it easier on you. Number four, This is something my mom used to do and it used to drive me crazy, but you know, I'm working on releasing what other people do now. She used to do say, I'm just going to save up for the meal. I repeat, do not save up for a meal. Once again, do not save up for a meal. And what I mean by that is don't not eat all day just to have a bigger meal later. This is just going to cause a lot of gut stress. You're stretching yourself without eating. Your blood sugar level is going to drop really low. And when that meal comes in, you're going to eat so fast. You're going to overeat. You're going to overload your body and you're going to cause so much inflammation. So do not do that. Have at least have water and small snacks throughout the day if you don't want to eat as much or try to have a balanced lunch. That way, when you go in, you're not super hungry and you don't overeat on stuff that you don't really actually want to eat. There's just... There's just no way around it when you do that. So balanced meals throughout the day or snacking, making sure you're drinking your water and not going in to a party starving. It's like the worst thing you could do for a food hangover, food coma, right? Okay, so then number five, you're at a party. There's a smorgasbord of every kind of food that you can possibly believe is in there. Some stuff you've never seen before, some stuff from your childhood, some stuff that's probably some vegan aunt like me brought that's like healthy on the side, right? The point is to, in the beginning, eat the stuff you would normally eat in your regular life. Okay, so let's say there's like, um, we'll call it Thanksgiving because, you know, through the holidays, it's all the same thing. But let's say there's salad and turkey and sweet potatoes. And then there's, um, you know, pistachio pudding and mashed potatoes with a bunch of butter and some pretzel dip thing. In your normal life, you probably wouldn't have some of those things. So eat the stuff you would have in your normal life first. Then you can have something fun after and you don't feel like you derailed your whole meal or put yourself into a food coma. 
Food coma, it's a funny statement, but it actually comes with a lot of problems after because that's what creates a lot of inflammation. So we want to make sure that we're not pushing ourselves overboard on on food and making ourselves uncomfortable because it's going to take a couple of days to come back from that, especially if you're someone who struggles with gut issues, right? Now, there's also an added benefit of taking digestive enzymes um, through, you know, and helping your body process this food, but I definitely don't recommend leaning on it. I want you guys to create a healthy relationship with food. Check in with your body often. How am I feeling? Is this food serving me? is a really good question to ask yourself throughout. Um, it's not about shaming yourself. It's just about understanding yourself. And I want you to understand yourself on a deeper, deeper level. And if you really are ready to do that, my mentorship program is the perfect time to do that. So if you haven't done it already, go ahead and book your discovery call. In the meantime, I hope these tips have helped. Please share with a friend. Give yourself an accountability buddy throughout the holidays. That always helps me to have someone accountability buddy go for walks or grab healthy meals in between all of these maybe unhealthy meals. Or maybe just reach out to family and talk to your family a little bit more about bringing in more health into the holidays, right? <laughs> so hopefully this has been helpful. Don't forget to subscribe YouTube or Spotify. Leave a, leave me a review. I love to hear from you, whether positive or negative, so that I can always work to serve you best. In the meantime, happy healing and happy holidays.